Hello, Easton, and welcome to the Rabbi's Roundtable. I'm Rabbi Peter Hyman, Rabbi at Temple B'nai Israel, and it's always a pleasure to welcome you to the Rabbi's Roundtable. I have a number of interesting and informative guests uh, for you to meet and for us to listen to. I want to first introduce you to Katie Russ. Katie works for the Talbot County Department of Social Services. She is a, uh, a member of the Child Services, Protective Services team. Mm -hmm. Katie, I'm glad you're here. Thank you for your time. And Sasha Greenfield. And Sasha works and is part of the team at For All Seasons. And uh, we're going to spend a few minutes talking about what you do, how it impacts the community, what, what needs you have, how, if there are needs out there, people can get in touch with you and uh, uh, we, can, we can interface and use this as a, a way for you to, to talk. So, Katie, um, let's start with you. Tell us about the program at the DSS. Sure. So, actually, Sasha was going to talk a little bit about um, her agency and what they have to offer. Okay. Um, you want to go first? Sure. Fine. Then we'll start with Sasha. <laughs> so I work at For All Seasons Incorporated. It is an outpatient mental health clinic, and we have offices in all five counties on the midshore. So we provide services to individuals, families, and children, um, and we also serve as yeah. the Rape Crisis Center and the Latino Drop-In Center for the midshore. Cool. So um, something that we're really proud of coming in June is that all of our therapists and all of our rape crisis staff is going to be trauma certified so we'll be better able to fit suit the needs of and what, what does that mean exactly Dan? so it's a nine-day extensive training um, on trauma there's two levels so we're all starting with our level one certification okay. um, to, to better serve trauma victims victims who have been sexually assaulted victims of child abuse child sexual abuse We'll get in statisti into statistics in a while. I mean, it, it's. Um, I'm glad you're here. I'm sorry you have to be. You, you know, you know, it's a difficult world. Yeah. Uh, something else. Tell folk more about uh, uh, what you do it for all seasons. Not only personally and professionally, but uh, but for all seasons in general. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I serve as the program coordinator for the Mobile Crisis Stabilization Service Program, cool. which works hand in hand with DSS to provide in-home. 24-hour services to families with children who have frequent crises and are at risk of out-of-home placement. And I'm also a clinician in the office um, in Easton. Cool. Well, yeah. we're, glad, we're, we're, yeah. we're glad to have you here. And Katie? And, and that's kind of how we got connected. So we worked together, um, and we worked to form this committee of uh, different people throughout the community. So there's nonprofits, there's churches, um, law enforcement, um, agencies throughout the uh, community that work with us on this program to start this Empower Me program. So Sasha is going to talk a little bit about the Empower Me program. Excellent. And you work with Ellen Grundin, uh, the Associate uh, yes, State's State Attorney. Yeah. Yes, she's yeah. part of our um, committee of community members. Excellent. All right, so, so tell us about the Empowerment Me program. That's yeah. pretty interesting, actually. I did a little reading on it, so go ahead. We are super excited to be bringing the Empower Me program to Talbot County. Basically, the purpose of the Empower Me program is to to provide education to prevent child abuse around Talbot County. And what we've done is developed an amazing group of community members from probably 15 to 20 different organizations in Talbot County who've all come together um, to make this a possibility. And what we've done is um, at the end of September, we had two trainings. They were a couple hours long each, mm -hmm. and we had over 90 people trained in the Empower Me model. Um, and now we are excited to be able to present the, the same program to children, parents, and other adults around the community. Is it a national program? It is a national oh, program. Cool. Um, we are one of the first counties to be taking the program in such a big stride, uh -huh. which is really cool. Um, it's, it's really a motivating, upbeat, positive way to teach children to protect themselves. And it focuses on eight basic safety rules um, that are taught throughout the, the training. Interesting. Yeah. So how busy are you? <sighs> we're, we're By that busy. I mean... 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know yeah. what I mean by that. Yeah. yeah. Talbot County, you know, I grew up here. It's a beautiful place to live. Um, unfortunately, people think that child abuse doesn't happen here. Um, and it does. Since 2014, Child Protective Services in Talbot County has responded to over 250 reports of abuse and neglect. And some of those reports have multiple children living in homes, siblings. Um, Actually, one in ten children will experience child maltreatment in their lifetime. Uh, one in five girls and one in 20 boys will experience child sexual abuse. Mm. So this program is really important for our community. Um, when, when does it get up? In June, you said it's going to be up and running? It's up and running now. Oh, it is? Yes. Oh, okay. So if you are interested in more information, you yes. can email us at empower.me at maryland.gov, and we'll send you as much information as you want. That's also a good place to send a request for a training. So if you have an organization, whether it be a business, um, a youth group, any, any organization that wants to learn more about the Empower Me program, we have a ton of presenters who are willing to come out and do those presentations free of cost. Oh, that's that's really important to know. And, and there are there are groups that, when we're off camera, I'll, I'll give you a couple of suggestions okay, because great. Uh, awesome. um, we we need to be more aware of this. And there's uh, two types of presentation. There's one that we do to children, so it teaches them personal safety, just like we teach kids about fire safety and bus mm -hmm. safety and crossing the street. It teaches them about personal safety, and those were some of the rules that Sasha was speaking about. And then there's also another presentation that's geared towards parents or adults. So if we went to, let's say, a church requested us to come, we could do a presentation to the children as well as one to the parents and adults. Um, because we see it as adults' jobs to protect children sure. and keep children safe, and it's a kid's job to be a kid, to have fun. And to be aware, you mm -hmm. know, aware of, sadly, uh, surroundings and whatever else. Exactly, no, that's, and that's what the parent one teaches a lot about, parents and adults. It teaches a lot about what to look for, what to do, how to talk to your child about these types of things, mm -hmm. how to have these conversations to protect them. Because in the past, a lot of people have taught stranger danger, and what they found is it's not effective, that most abusers are known to the child. 90% uh -huh. are known to the wow. child. So this program teaches children how to talk to strangers, how to ask for help if something were to happen to them, how to reach out, how to identify that uh-oh feeling, and what to do when that happens. Oh, excellent. And, and one more time, look into the camera, and we'll put the email address up, but just give it to us one more time. Empower.me at maryland.gov. Wonderful. Listen, I'm, I'm deeply appreciative to the both of you for taking the time. We've been talking with Katie Russ from the Talbot uh, County Department of Social Services and uh, Sasha Greenfield from all, For All Seasons yes. about the Empower Me program, mm -hmm. which deals with uh, education on uh, child Preventing child abuse. Preventing child abuse. Thank you, ladies, Thank for being you. here. Thank you. Uh, we will follow up in the spring with a... With a another show you'll okay, come back great. and tell awesome. us how it's going Sounds we'll good. be back easton thanks much is this thing on <coughs> play it Should tumble and 
as you stand, stand by me. back and uh, joining me now is a uh, dear friend uh, somebody that's not a stranger to the rabbi's roundtable dr barbara vinear thank you for being here dr vinear is president of chesapeake college and we're going to talk about a number of things but let's talk first about the new building it's very cool it's one of my favorite things to talk about and uh, as i tell people i actually moved my parking place so that i walk through the building every Real? day I didn't every, know that. every <laughs> single day to see what the students are doing and to watch them practice volleyball basketball whatever sport is in season so it's great and one of the things that happened recently that I don't think we even expected. I was up in the EMS lab and apartment, which is where we have our ambulance box and our apartment oh, cool. uh, where student, the EMS students yeah. practice extracting students. We have a car that they can turn over. Oh, it's, cool. it's just a, a great place. And I saw the criminal justice faculty member there, and then I saw the theater faculty member there, and I said, what are you doing in the EMS lab? So they were organizing role playing where the theater students played suspected oh, cool. drug dealers. The criminal justice students had to execute a warrant in that apartment, and then the EMS students had to come in and respond to, to overdose victims. And so that's the kind of thing we never would have been oh, able to do before. Very cool. Really Un unintended, special. Unintended, unexpected yeah, consequences. Yeah, because we brought all the faculty up from Easton, and they're now on campus, and they're talking to each other in ways that didn't happen. And I just, I love watching all of the health profession students use the new equipment and really enjoy the space that they're in. So For those and, who might, yeah. have not, might not have seen the article in the newspaper. It houses not only uh, athletic facilities. Right. Well, it does house all our athletic facilities. So the gym, the training room, which we never had before, yeah. a brand new fitness center donated by Dixon Valve, a yoga and dance studio. Cool. We actually have two gyms. We have the uh, playing gym and yeah. the practice gym, gotcha. which is also a multi-purpose room. And then we brought all of our health programs up. So we have, I know I'm going to forget something, uh, nursing, radiologic science, EMS, Dental assisting, certified nurse assistant, uh, that Veteran. phlebotomy, we're working on phlebotomy, we're not offering at the moment, re but we're revising that curriculum so it will be a certificate. And veterinary I, stuff or no? No, we are our veterinary assistant program is not over there, but we are actually talking to some of the vets in the area about a second level program. Oh, so cool. my apologies to anybody who I forgot. It's all right. But uh, it's a wide range of programs and meets the needs of different students and, and people in the well, community. You're to be credited. I'm not being gratuitous. Uh, you're to be credited with having some vision and a high horizon. It adds to the substance of our, our community and good for you, which Thank brings you. me to the next subject. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the concept of, of uh, free college. How do you, where do you, where are you in this? How do you feel? Uh, well, let talk. me start by saying, and my students say this is ancient history, uh, but I went to college for nothing, at least for the first two years. Um, I went to college not long after Russia launched its satellite Sputnik, and we went, it was the middle of the Cold War, of course, yeah. and we went into this panic that we could not compete in the space arms race or the space race. And so the federal government said, the only way we can do that is to have more scientists, more well-educated people, so let's start a program 
to get people a college education. And so my first two years of college, I had a grant that then became a loan, but it was an investment on the part of the government because there was a perceived need for higher education. I think we have a pretty compelling case nationally right now I agree. that we need more educated people. Absolutely. We, uh, we have a lot of hot wars going on around the, around the world, and education is one answer to that. We need more scientists, but we also need what are called middle skill jobs. These are jobs that require post secondary education. Mm -hmm. They require something after high school, but not necessarily a bachelor's degree. And in Maryland alone right now, there are 138,000 vacancies that companies can't fill. And these wow. are things like truck driving and uh, electricians. You know, a lot of these are technical yeah. fields. They're Skill what technical. we call trades. Yeah. You know, this is not your grandfather's truck driving anymore. Uh, these these jobs do require some college education or some post high school the college education has a truck driving yes, program yes we do we and have it's not just drivers ed i understand right, that right and uh, w you know we have a lot of those kinds of programs but they're expensive they're expensive for us to run and one of the things that's happened in this country is that lower income people are being shut out of post secondary education um, in 1980, a Pell Grant, which is given to mm -hmm. the poorest strata of our society, covered 99% of the cost of a community college education. It now covers 52%. Wow. And a poor person needs about 76% of their income in order to go to school. And of course, the more money you make, the less that fixed right. cost re sure. represents yeah. in, in your yeah. income level or, or your out-of-pocket. So what we're doing is saying, okay, we could do without all those people. Clearly, we can't, because if they don't get an education, we can't fill the jobs that need to be filled. So what's happening around the country is that communities, cities, and states are starting to look at this and say, we should make this investment. And how, how do they, so that's my next question. I, I love the idea. I agree mm -hmm. with it. Um, uh, interesting, a, few, a couple months ago, the Wall Street Journal had a, uh, an article in it. I think it was the Wall Street Journal, maybe the New York Times, doesn't matter. Uh, about, I think it matters a lot. Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> they might have very different well, opinions. No, but the, the point was that college-educated people across the board in the United States are still a minority over against, when, when placed against hmm. folk who are not college-educated. And, and while you and I may assume that the whole world has higher education, mm -hmm. Or all of America has it's it's not true, and mm -hmm. I, I thought that was an act, actually a startling um, and, and eye-opening figure that uh, we we still represent a minority in spite of the fact that almost everybody I know went to college, and mm -hmm. I still hang with my college buddies and all that sort of mm -hmm. thing. So, uh, given the idea that this is a uh, given that this is a good idea, how do you pay for it? Uh, what 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 has to happen? Well, if you're looking at the state level. Yeah. It's, it really starts with programs that are already in existence so that you don't replace federal financial aid, you don't replace the Pell Grant, you don't yeah. replace other forms of aid, you add to it. Okay. And so you start there. And also this is not a, just a giveaway. The students that participate have to maintain a certain grade point average. Okay. In Tennessee, Tennessee started their program in, well it was passed into law in May of 2014. This year, they had 15,000 additional students go to college, to community college. Wow. And they have to be enrolled in either an associate degree or a, a workplace yeah. kind yeah. of certificate. Um, and they have to maintain a 2.0, a C average, yeah. and they have to give 20 hours a week of community service. So, so there's buy-in on, yeah, right. that's great. So they're still yeah. getting a contribution back to the community even while they cool. are in school. Uh, so clearly we need to wait and see what the data is over time. We looked at it for Maryland, and if Maryland were to do that after the federal programs and existing yeah. financial aid, it would be about $33 million. But the return on investment is about 8%. Wow. And so those students get jobs pay higher taxes, don't use the services in the system the way people without yeah, education yeah. do. And there's real hard data. That's no, not I, just, uh, I, I know that. you know, Barbara Vinny are making this I, up. I that, that says if you have a college education, first of all, you're much less likely to end up in jail. Right. You're less likely to need any kind of social service. And so there's both the uh, 
reduced cost and there's the actual the benefit, of, benefit of more high, of more taxes and higher taxes. And, and this, uh, over the years, the, the role and the influence and the effectiveness of community colleges has up, been upgraded and ameliorated. This, this, this speaks not, I, I know your vision for, uh, for Chesapeake, and, and it speaks directly to that as well as to the, all the other colleges, community colleges mm -hmm. from coast to coast. Mm -hmm. How important is this? I mean, this is... I think it's incredibly important. And again, I think it's important because we have a real need. And, you know, it, yes, students would like more help to go to college, but the people really clamoring for a lot of this are employers. Yeah. They're the ones saying, I cannot find people to fill the jobs that I have. Qualified. I can't grow my business. Uh, we had a meeting recently with the Secretary of Commerce, the, the newly designated yeah. Secretary of Commerce, and then with the Director of Education and Innovation in that new department. And they're talking all about recruitment and retention and economic growth. Well, the linchpin for that is education. You cannot bring a company here without saying, we have a workforce for you. Absolutely. And, and that's vital. And very often it's a community college that is looked to to provide that kind of ongoing training. It's interesting because in, in one respect this is a game changer. And, you know, again, from where I'm sitting, this discussion, it's a no-brainer. Well, there's you know. a cost. I mean, right. I understand that, that. You know, that's the problem. Uh, we're not the only people at the knocking Correct. at the door saying this is a good investment. There are other people who can make that claim. There are other costs that are not an investment. They're just your former guest taking care yeah, of people yeah. you know that's clearly a priority too so i understand that i just think that we know there's a return on investment and that those students ultimately make a contribution to their communities and the good thing about if we had a program in maryland 92 percent of the community graduate community college graduates stay in maryland so they're not going to take their degree right. and move to another state right. and in, and then the investment, the return on investment goes someplace else. Yeah. Community college students, the return on investment stays here. Oh, that's really so interesting. So I, I certainly think it's worth looking at. Um, I don't know what will happen with the national model. Tennessee, I think, is working. Oregon has a, a model now that they're about to implement. There is one county in Maryland, Garrett County, that has had this in effect for several years. Enrollment is up. Students take advantage of it. Um, Allegheny County in Maryland has not a full-blown program, but something yeah. like it. The whole city of Pittsburgh has a program. Oh, wow. So, you know, there are models out there to look at, and I think the challenge for Maryland is to find out what would work here and what makes the most sense and Do you have a target it. date? or do you uh, We are proposing it in this legislative session. Cool. It usually takes a while for yeah, things yeah, to course, actually um, happen. And, and we feel this is something that a conservative General Assembly, more conservative General Assembly than in the past, and a Republican governor can get behind. Yep. It's, it's good economic policy. Absolutely. Well, it sounds that way. Um, Obviously, anything that educates and uh, ameliorates is good for everybody, by and large. Uh, in the spring, will you come back and will I want to talk more no. about this? this? No, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I would um, be delighted. Thank you very much. We've been talking with Dr. Barbara Vineyard. Barbara, as you know, is the president of Chesapeake College, visionary and uh, creative force behind what we see. Uh, by the way, the, the, the wind turbine has become a landmark. It has. It's, very, it's, it has. it's, it's all good. And, still and what working? you don't see is we're about to break ground for a six-acre solar field that you won't see from the road that oh. will reduce our energy cost by over seventy thousand dollars a year in addition to what the mm -hmm. wind turbine mm -hmm. very cool you'll come back you'll, you'll give I us will. a report uh, always a pleasure dr vineyard to have you at the rabbi's round table we'll be back easton is this thing on <coughs> play it
just as long as you stand, stand by me. So dark. Just as long as you stand, stand by me. And joining me now is a friend, a familiar face to the Rabbi's Roundtable, my dear friend, uh, Professor Joseph Prudhomme. Pro Joe uh, is a professor, as some of you know, at Washington College. Indeed. And he directs the Institute for Religion, Politics, and Culture. And Indeed. it's always a pleasure to well, have you at I the Well, I tell Rabbi's you, it's always a treat for me. And I genuinely appreciate your taking the, taking the time well, to, to visit with me. No, no, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I, it's always good, and I yeah. appreciate it, but especially now, uh, I don't want to dwell on it. I know there's been a, a sadness uh, indeed, that, that indeed. is over a and that you've been involved yeah, in it. Tremendous but, sadness, uh, indeed. Uh, I think, as, as many of our viewers may know, there was a tragedy on the Washington College campus, yep. which took place just before Thanksgiving. Yep. Uh, a wonderful, wonderful student, a remarkable young man, um, unfortunately took his took his life. Um, and I had uh, the honor and, and really the blessing to know him. And uh, I was also honored and blessed to be able to share some words at his memorial oh, service oh, in, in oh, Philadelphia nice. the day before Thanksgiving. And Peter, as you know, uh, we'll be holding a memorial service on the campus of Washington College yes. Saturday, December the 12th. 12th at 5 p.m. And my just heart goes out to you for agreeing to participate. Uh, no, in that. I'm, and it's uh, just a, an honor. You know, I, I was thinking, um, not to get sure. morbid or, or maudlin, um, we are, the world is connected in, yes, in strange yeah. ways. Yeah. I mean, there, I didn't know Jacob Marburger and... Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but I know you, and I know he was a student that, that you recommended to do mm -hmm. above mm -hmm. and beyond yeah. Yeah. opportunities. And um, I am honored that you well, asked well, we're, we're delighted and, and appreciative and, uh, of, of, of that. And if I, any way yeah. I can help, because uh, well, I know you. this doesn't thank affect you. just just you uh, guys. The whole, yeah, you know, we, were, we were watching it down here as well yeah. and going, wow, this is close to home, too closer indeed. to home than we like. Indeed, indeed, uh, indeed. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a terrible tragedy, but the college is, is united, and the college is going to be thinking about ways that they can help to improve yeah. uh, uh, it, the delivery of services to students who may feel that they're in a position of despondency or may enter into a kind of black uh, blackness that, that just needs yeah. some help to get out of. And so we're committed entirely as a college to do everything we can, really to be a pace setter at the national level for, uh, for improving uh, the uh, opportunities that we have for students to take advantage of, uh, Good. Of, of, of the services that they feel they may need. One, you know? you know, not to belabor the point, one last one or two sentences, but you know, if, if I'm lying on the ground and there's a bone yeah, sticking right. out oh, of my yeah, arm yeah, and yeah, blood yeah. spurting, everybody knows yeah, what to absolutely. do, it's obvious. It is not so obvious when it comes to 
um, mental health oh, issues. It, it, that exactly, and there was so also, unfortunately, in this in this case, uh, an issue of some tension, social tension that had taken that t had taken place on campus, and that was magnified by social media. And one of the things that our president, President Sheila Baird, is is going to do is to uh, to convene a commission, uh, and uh, it's going to look at uh, how to make campuses as welcoming for all students as possible. Cool. So we're committed to moving forward, but it was no doubt a tremendous blow to all of us. Yep. Uh, yep. And uh, we will congregate uh, on Saturday the 12th to, to, to celebrate once again this remarkable young and, man's and life. I will so. be there, and I'm, as Great. I said, I'm honored to do that. Moving on. Yes, sir. Let's talk about your big event on December 3rd. Well, Which December the 3rd, we have Ross Douthit, a uh, very accomplished author, uh, an award-winning uh, public intellectual who uh, has a weekly column with the New York Times. Yep. He's going to share his reflections on religion and culture and higher education in the United States. Uh, that will be Thursday, December the 3rd at 6 p.m. at the heart of the Washington College campus. And it's a really a remarkable opportunity for our students to have the opportunity to engage with a person of his stature. He really is... Uh, a very, very interesting, very distinguished speaker, and it will be just lovely to have students have that engagement with him. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a rare thing that uh, that we at a, a small liberal arts college can afford our students the opportunity to, to be with uh, eminent people like him uh, on a really intimate, small sure. basis and, and just exchange ideas. So, as, yeah. as you know, I think I call Washington College a, a gem, yeah. and we yeah. are fortunate. I am fortunate yeah. personally, sure. not only through your uh, my friendship with you and our friendship, I was always appreciative to the yeah. former president. Oh, wonderful man. Uh, Rabbi, uh, and our, Rabbi, our new, Dr. Uh, uh, Mitchell, Mitchell Reese. Reese. And our new president, Sheila Bear, is doing a fantastic yep. job. I hear that. And, and we are fortunate that we you we can avail ourselves oh, of, yeah. of this. Oh, yeah. The, the, pro the programs I've attended that, that the Institute has sponsored Thank are you. really remarkable. Yeah, well, and wonderful. I appreciate that. And, of course, you've been a stalwart supporter. No, no, not blowing uh, smoke. Well, it's, no, it's, I understand. It's no, substantive, no, and you're making that. a difference in the lives of you know the kids that go to Washington College will go... Will Right. go out to be leaders in the world and they will Absolutely. have a horizon that's high well a broad, which is broad perspective indeed you know uh, uh, I think so yeah. and I, yeah. not to not to uh, change the subject but uh, you, you you take kids to to um, Israel, to, to, you take to, Israel, to Israel, to Oxford, to, to Rome. Oxford, to um, Rome. Right. Exactly. I want to yeah. be one of your students. <laughs> hey, all right. You know, I don't know if you can get in, man. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> I probably couldn't. Uh, that's, that's, right, right, we'll right, talk about right, that off yeah, camera. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, that's exciting. So tomorrow night, where's it going to so, be? So held? it's at Henson Lounge, which is our handsome uh, major room at the heart of campus in what's called the Hudson Hall. So Henson Lounge of Hudson Hall, uh, with a 6 p.m. start time. Excellent. So uh, if anyone is uh, able to make the way up to Chestertown, be delighted to have it. It's free, open to the yeah. public. They're Opportunities for uh, extensive exchange and question and answer after his prepared remarks. We're really looking forward to it. And I know so. you have some programs in the spring. Indeed, that are indeed. Up, we, we can talk about it now and yeah, we'll come yeah, back. Yeah, but, no, I'd uh, love to. I, absolutely love to. We have a number of events already scheduled. Uh, we have a, a remarkable young woman uh, named Naomi uh, uh, Schaefer Riley, and uh, she's written a book called Got Milk, um, excuse me, <laughs> called Got Religion, which is riffing off of the uh, commercial Got, yeah. Got Milk. And her book there is subtitled How Faith Communities Are Winning Millennials Back. It's a fascinating Ooh, thesis. And so what there. she does is she looks at a wide variety of churches and synagogues and how they are doing good work in bringing millennials back to the faith traditions that you know have enriched our our, our culture for so many uh, decades. Um, and uh, there's been a wane in religiosity among the youth. Um, and uh, so she's saying, well, no, there's actually counter forces afoot as well. And uh, so that's going to be really interesting. That's going to be in the first part of. February, and of course we'd be delighted at be delighted to. Have no, it. no, yeah. I'll I'll definitely be there because this whole notion of religiosity yeah, versus right. spirituality, yes, indeed, ritual yeah. versus mm -hmm. transcendent yeah. reality right. is is right. 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 something that I deal with. And, you you, and you deal with it, and, and and what we see actually in, in some of the data is that uh, younger uh, people are not necessarily less inquisitive about metaphysical and transcendental or or or, or supernatural uh, uh, perspectives, but are um, um, wanting to seek uh, uh, an approach which is not in the form of conventional religious practice, right? Correct. And uh, Correct. so, the, but but there's an opportunity for churches, for organized religious communities, to make inroads with uh, young uh, young adults with that perspective. Uh, and she documents uh, synagogues and churches which are doing tremendous work in that. In I, that I will definitely so. be there because uh, I tell people all the time that you cannot judge the success of a synagogue or a church 
by who comes to services on Friday, Saturday, yeah, or Sunday. Yeah, that's right. That it, that it has to be a, a broader and more um, um, expanded definition. And, and, and in fact, Rabbi, it's, it's the congregations which approach their mission precisely yes. in that way yeah. which are growing, yeah. right? Yeah. It's those which engage students and sustain the young adults and sustain community yep. outreach and community service. It's those also which provide for intergenerational mentoring yep. and opportunities to be engaged with people throughout the entire week. And so it's exactly that kind of a, uh, of, of a congregation which is seeing growth. You know? and, and it's also about, I think, Self-definitions. I don't mean yeah. personal self-definition, yeah. but institutional yeah, definition. Right, right, right. Meaning, um, um, how do I engage people? And not everybody wants to sit. I may have yeah, the most yeah. brilliant sermons in yeah. the world. Well, you do. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. But uh, that may not speak to a, a group of folk yeah. who still um, yeah. are supportive and maintain membership. And how do I how do I yeah. approach them? How do I engage them? It may be through a non-sanctuary-centered uh, right, exactly. program. E e e exactly. I think that's right. You know, it's really interesting, the wisdom of the rabbis. Uh, in the Talmud, the rabbis say that the, a synagogue functions on three levels. Mm -hmm. It's a house of prayer, which is the religious aspect. Yeah. It's the house of study, which is the educational. And, and there's always overlap. Sure. And there's a, it's a house of gathering, a yes, social indeed, component. Indeed, indeed. Indeed. And, and and that certainly has yeah. oh, I think informed that's right. my I, I, I think that's approach right. to programming. I think that's right. And I think what we're seeing, again, in those communities of faith which are growing is that they embrace all of those, right? There was a trend in Christian churches uh, a few decades ago to emphasize the social component of it a little bit more than the intellectual component. And you need to have a, a, you know rational engagement with the principles of your faith because, you know, people who grow up in a religious family are going to have questions, sure. right? And and so what, we, what, what congregations which are growing, according to this scholar, do is they normalize a bit of the questioning about the principles of one's faith so that it doesn't hit one when one's 18, that, oh sure. my gosh, maybe this isn't right. But they've been discussing and reflecting and learning all throughout their time at the synagogue or at the church. And so, Absolutely. So I think it's, it's important that they have that social component, but that it also be grounded in a kind of critical and learning perspective about their faith, right? And then also the, the liturgy as well. And, and and that can be either um, transformational and inspirational, mm -hmm. or it can be really off-putting, depending yeah. on the rigidity of, yeah. of the right. of the community right. and, and, right. and the, right. the horizon of the community. That's true. That's true. And, and, That's true. Um, for me, it's yeah. clear where I where I fall in this argument. Would you remind us the name of the scholar and and the date again? Naomi Schaefer Riley. Her work is Got Religion. Question mark: How communities of faith are winning millennials back? Cool. And her That's presentation right. will be in will be in early February. Early February. Uh, and we also have a few other events. We have a distinguished philosopher of religion coming from California in cool. um, in the uh, early part of April. We have a presentation on the uh, persecution of Christian minorities in the Middle East that's happening in uh, March. Oh, cool. uh, and so we have a number of really, really interesting events. Do you know who's up. coming in on that? Uh, who will be there? Tim Shaw. Tim Shaw, Georgetown University, a remarkable scholar. Uh, and J.P. Moreland, uh, yeah. a philosopher of religion, coming in April. Uh, so a lot that's on the horizon. And then in addition, uh, you know, our sustained mentoring of, program of students uh, and uh, our peer review book series and other, uh, other activities of the Institute as well. So. Very cool. Uh, very exciting. Again, yeah, well, uh, uh, we've been talking with the Professor Joe Prudhomme from Washington College. Joe runs the Institute for Religion, Politics, and Culture, and you just heard why it's so successful. Right. Uh, well, creativity. we're just honored to have you be a part of it. Peter. Well, we're I'm, really I'm glad to, to do what I can when I can anytime. Right. Thank you for being Thank at the round so table. Much. We'll see you next time, Easton. Have a good holiday.
And the land is dark And the moon is the only light we'll see No, I won't be afraid Oh, I won't be afraid Just as long as you stand Stand by me So dark Just as long as you stand, stand by me.